So the goals of surgery are to reduce or eliminate seizure activity while minimizing any potential complication from the surgery itself or a neurological consequence of the intervention. So now I'll talk about some of the surgeries um, that we use in epilepsy. And later in the talk, I'll, I'll delve into a little bit more detail about each one of them. I like to sort of categorize them as either palliative or definitive. Um, the goal of a palliative procedure is to reduce the number or severity of, of, of seizures. Whereas the goal of a definitive procedure is to cure the patient of epilepsy. We don't always meet that goal, but that is the goal if we embark on one of these um, treatments uh, in this column. Um, and nonetheless, when we don't meet that goal, we still um, more often than not attain a worthwhile uh, reduction. The procedures here highlighted in red are those that are applicable to temporal lobe epilepsy, which we'll discuss today. And the ones in black are um, actually much more, much less common um, and, uh, and kind of outside of the scope of, of our talk today. So thinking about temporal lobe epilepsy, um, our major workhorse here is the temporal lobectomy, um, at least historically, and, uh, and it is the most common surgical procedure we practice for temporal lobe epilepsy uh, by far, and it's also the procedure we have the most rigorous data for. Um, you can see here at the top of this chart um, that there are two randomized control trials um, when thinking about uh, temporal lobectomy. Uh, for temporal lobe epilepsy. Prior to these randomized controlled trials, you know, uh, sometimes people would think of uh, temporal lobectomies and epilepsy surgery as, you know, something that was 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 some didn't have a lot of uh, good data driven behind it. But here, what we can see is um, of these uh, in this 2001 study um, by Weeby et al. Uh, 40 patients were included in the surgery arm and 40 patients were included in the control arm. And 58% um, of patients who underwent temporal lobectomy achieved seizure freedom compared to 8% uh, of patients um, who just received standard medical practice. So clearly it's a very significant difference. And um, of all patients in the surgical group, even though they didn't all achieve seizure freedom, 80% um, derived a substantial benefit from the procedure. Um, when you look at our second RCT angle at all, smaller numbers, this was actually um, prematurely closed because of enrollment issues, but 73% of patients um, in the surgery group achieved seizure three freedom after temporal lobectomy compared to none of the controls, and 100% of the patients achieved a worthwhile reduction in seizures. Um, so those are the randomized controlled trials. If you look at just large meta-analyses, it really corroborates this kind of um, data that we have uh, when it comes to uh, um, looking at surgery arms versus the control arm. So what are the cognitive consequences um, of, of uh, epilepsy surgery? Because that's what we most fear. Um, oftentimes we're doing uh, resections of tissue. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about um, the viability of that tissue and whether or not a resection of this area of the brain will cause any sort of um, uh, uh, alteration in cognition. Um, but if you look at the large kind of cohort of patients, when we analyze their neuropsychological data, uh, we see that there are both gains and losses um, in, in patients. The vast majority of patients will probably not experience much of either, at least not notice it. Um, but if we, if, we, if we do very rigorous neuropsychological testing before and after, um, we do see particularly when we intervene in the dominant hemisphere and the temp dominant temporal lobe, we can see losses in verbal memory. Um, that's really kind of the biggest, most feared complication. And now we have a lot of interesting options in the realm of neuromodulation, which are uh, often not definitive, but palliative procedures, but allow us to circumvent this potential um, side effect. Also, uh, similarly uh, in the dominant hemisphere, we can see decreases in naming and uh, 
usually in the non-dominant hemisphere, although in this study, they really kind of looked equal, we can see some um, decreases in visual memory, although it's important to look at the other side where we also see gains uh, in visual memory for those patients who have been treated. Um, things that don't tend to be affected are things like IQ and executive functioning. Um, again, we see gains and losses when we look at neuropsychological data before and after. Um, and things like attention and verbal fluency actually tend to improve um, after a, a, a procedure like temporal lobectomy, us really often um, ostensibly because we've now controlled the seizures and, uh, and, and, and usually can get patients after a period of time off of their anti-epileptic medications as well. Um, Self-reported cognitive declines are rare in only 9% of patients um, and cognitive gains are more common um, in 18% of patients. So it really is a balancing act um, and it's important to understand you know, the dominance of the hemisphere that we're operating on. Nonetheless, despite the fact that uh, epilepsy surgery can be extremely effective and uh, can really provide a, a, a cure for um, a portion of patients, there still remains a lot of hindrances towards referral of epilepsy patients to epilepsy centers. Um, a study was done about this, you know, querying why, and it's really a lot of times, actually, unfortunately, a lack of awareness of clinical practice guidelines. Um, these patients oftentimes will stay um, being treated by their general practitioner or often or a general neurologist, um, maybe never actually get referred to an epileptologist um, or, or an epilepsy center and can really go um, a lifetime sometimes without um, achieving seizure control. So we, we want to avoid that. Um, a lot of times, uh, referring practitioners are just not sure if a patient qualifies as having drug resistant epilepsy, the definition of, of course, of which we, um, discussed, um, lack of knowledge or misconceptions regarding the safety and efficacy of surgery, um, concern for potential neurological complications, expense of surgery, which is of course, um, covered by insurance, just like any other surgery. Patients, of course, have um, their own uh, uh, specific hindrances, like just the concept of brain surgery, which is true for many of our procedures, um, concern that the procedure is experimental. We see this in a lot of functional neurosurgery, you know, including things like deep brain stimulation, um, which of course is, is not true, um, lack of an understanding of the risk profile, or just never actually told that there was a surgery or a surgical option for their epilepsy. So this is really important um, to train both patients and doctors about what the options are and, uh, and who qualifies um, to be referred to an epilepsy center. So now it's generally more accepted that the fulfillment of the definition of drug resistance in a patient should prompt a comprehensive review um, by an epilepsy center. Um, if they meet the definition of drug resistance, meaning they've failed two medications, or if their seizures are not adequately controlled over a 12 month period. So when these patients come to an epilepsy center, you know, what do we do and how do we think about this? Well, the goals of our surgical evaluation, um, are one to identify the epileptogenic focus. Um, determine the resection margins if that is uh, if that's a um, uh, if that's possible, and of course evaluate the eloquence of uh, involved and surrounding brain. But ultimately, epilepsy surgery is really detective work. These patients often come to us with um, normal MRIs and not a lot of clues as to where their seizures are actually coming from and if they are coming from one location in their brain. So the goal really ultimately is to determine, is there a well-defined seizure focus, hopefully one, um, it, within this patient's brain? And if so, where is that focus? And is there an intervention that we can offer um, to, to help? So how do we do this big kind of detective project? Um, we uh, split it up into phases. So phase one um, consists of just a standard uh, focused history and physical examination. 
um, a comprehensive neurological evaluation, um, critically an inpatient audiovisual EEG. This is where the patient gets admitted to the hospital to the epilepsy monitoring unit. And we place scalp electrodes on their head and we usually have a video camera uh, monitoring their activity. Um, and oftentimes we'll keep them in the hospital from anywhere between two to five days for a study like this so that they're in a controlled environment. And if necessary, the epileptologist may taper their um, uh, anti-epileptics or do other provocative mm -hmm. measures. Um, and the goal of this study is for them to have a seizure in a controlled environment so that we can see um, what they're physically doing when they have a seizure, which is their seizure semiology, which helps us in localizing where these seizures are coming from and also see what their EEG activity is like. Um, uh, through the scalp electrodes. That gives us a lot of detailed information about where seizures are coming from. Um, we also do a very specialized MRI. We, on all patients, at least in our center, get a PET scan to look for a PET studies metabolism in the brain. And oftentimes a seizure focus will have actually decreased metabolism. That area will not be functioning um, normally. And we can often see that on PET. Um, and we, on all patients, perform a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation that can actually help us to um, also determine where the seizure focus is. For example, if a patient um, has a lot of naming or verbal memory dysfunction, that may localize their seizures uh, to the dominant hemisphere, mesial temporal lobe. Um, that all of these things just provide us clues um, that we try to synthesize to create a plan. Phase two, the, the numbers of these phases can be confusing. They're actually different in different parts of the country. Phase two, I actually like to call phase 1.5. Um, it's a more specialized and more invasive testing. And this is only testing we do if necessary. Ictal SPECT, I'll talk about in a little bit, functional MRI to lateralize language uh, dominance. Uh, and perform other things. Um, a WADA test and MR spectroscopy can all be, as well as MEG, magneto, magnetoencephalogram can also be used as sort of additional measures to, uh, to help us understand where seizures are coming from. Um, phase three, which is also known as phase two, is a uh, intracranial EEG evaluation and phase four is a treatment plan, which may or may not be surgical. A patient might undergo this evaluation and we might say, hey, we really don't have a good surgical option for you. Um, so that's important when considering starting the workup. Um, so again, phase one, we discussed audiovisual EEG monitoring, assess the semiology, um, we do an epilepsy protocol MRI, a PET scan. You can see here on this PET scan, we're looking for hypometabolism. So this is a really nice picture where we see that uh, the right side here um, has decreased uptake compared to the left side. And that can be a, a really nice clue as to where seizures are coming from. Um, and then neuropsychological text, testing here in phase 1.5, sometimes known as phase two, um, ictal uh, SPECT is done really at only uh, specific, really in specific centers. Um, SPECT, as you may know, is single photon emission CT. It utilizes a tracer to look at regional blood flow. And the way we do this test actually is to bring the patient into the hospital for the audiovisual EEG. And immediately at the moment that their seizure starts, we inject um, this tracer uh, and then send the patient down for a scan. Um, we take the ictal spect, um, subtract the intra-ictal spect, and then we uh, can sometimes, if the study is done well, um, see the focus of, of activity where the seizure started. Um, and I won't go into a lot of detail about these other tests, but happy to answer. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.